All right. Well, let's get started. It's 1235. Uh, it's wonderful to see all of you. Uh, welcome to, to the last day of class. I'm so damn proud of you um, for what you've done and, and how we've continued to thrive. So, so let me just let you know how, how effing proud I am of you guys. Um, a few announcements and we'll, we'll finish Rorty. So the first announcement, as you know, uh, the final, the final is due next Thursday, a week from today, next Thursday, May 14th, a week from today. And what, what time did I say it was due? Five. Five. Fabulous. Send it to me by five. Okay. And email it to me at my CSUN email address, address, address. You, you have the email. Um, and uh, please read the instructions. Don't exceed eight pages. Uh, double space it and put some page numbers on it. That would be great. I'd be so grateful for that. Um, is there any questions about that? You're, you're, you're responsible for Rorty's introduction and chapters one, two, and three. Uh, that's what you're responsible for. And then anything you want to, you know, anything you want to reach back from Mill and Nietzsche to bring in too, you're, you're welcome because the, the, the final, you're, you're not obligated to write the final on Mill and Nietzsche and Rorty. But, but the question says, how does uh, Rorty sort of radicalize Mill? How does Rorty make Mill postmodern? And how does Rorty make Nietzsche amenable to democratic politics, right? So if you, know, if you have an opportunity to, to, to weave in a little Mill, weave in a little Nietzsche, that's great. Um, but the focus is on, on Mill and Mill's project, the creation of a postmodern liberal democracy. Um, so that's that's the final. You know what you need to read. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Nope, beautiful. Um, so before we get into, oh, and by the way, I sent you the lecture notes for chapter three. You guys got them? Fabulous. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you're so welcome. <laughs> you guys seem so disappointed on Tuesday when I told you I couldn't have them. I could, I could hear and feel this, this quantum sadness. <laughs> <laughs> the quiet groaning. Yeah, well, it wasn't so quiet. It wasn't. So, <laughs> <laughs> so good. I'm glad you have them. All right, so let's let's get started because we have some things to do, and I don't want to run out of time. Um, so the first thing we have to do uh, is literally finish a few thoughts from chapter two. I was really heartbroken uh, that we were running out of time on Tuesday. One, because I would have liked to have spoken about this point and with all the energy and the motivation we had at, on Tuesday since we were talking about this. I was, I was kind of heartbroken to have to break it off um, in that sense. Uh, and, and, and and now to have to bring it up uh, early like this and then drop it and go to chapter three, but it, it's just the way it is. Um, and, and not only do I want to bring it up, but it's, but it's, I, I think it's one of the most interesting and fascinating points in all of Rorty's thinking. Uh, just for me in my own idiosyncratic peculiar way, I'm really fascinated by, by the way Rorty talks about this point that we're going to get to right now and the way that he talks about the the movement of history and the movement of art and the movement of thinking in general right and rorty's got this really kind of interesting way to to think about that and and we were ending we were we were ending tuesday's lecture and ending chapter two with this fascinating discussion about how Rorty redescribes or reinterprets or provides for us a new way of how to think about Freud, how to think about Freud, right? How can, how can we think about Freud and what Freud did and how can we make that useful to us, right? And, and, and to put it in Rorty's language, Rorty redescribes Freud. He interprets what he thinks is the most creative and interesting elements of Freud's project, and he presses those elements of Freud's project into his own poetic vision, right? That's what Rorty does. It's, it's really profound. Um, and so he says, he says you know, if, if we stop thinking about Freud in this metaphysical way as this kind of psychiatrist who, who to 
postulated this kind of a or objective claim about how childhood development is and and how the brain develops and whether that's healthy or normal or deviant if 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 we kind of set that story aside and we think about freud's story of the collective unconscious and the collective unconscious as a kind of repository for all the things that happen to us all the contingent little things the good and bad the joyful the traumatic all the little what what larkin had called the blind impresses at the beginning of the chapter if we think of freud's idea of the collective of conscious as a kind of repository of all of these influences, all these kind of contingent blind impresses, right, affecting us and, and affecting how our brain develops and how our childhood develops, right? If we think about all of that, if Freud's sort of collective unconscious as a repository of these imprints, and, 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 and we think about collective unconsciousness as then potential a resource, a reservoir from which all of this creative redescription, this creative reimagine of those imprints and those influences, right? We think of all of that as a kind of resource, an infinite resource, right? A reservoir for potential creativity, for potential redescription, for the process by which you and I learn how to tell the story of our lives in these deeply private, these deeply idiosyncratic, these deeply personal ways, right? And, 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 and as we said, for Rorty, in a way, Freud sort of democratizes the potentiality for individuality and the potentiality for genius, right? Every, everybody, right? Everybody has a kind of collective unconscious. Everybody has this reservoir of of, of, of joys and sufferings and, dra and traumas and hopes and influences, right? That we've experienced as we, as we go through our lives, right? And, and everybody has this and, and, and it's very deep, it's quite profound. And if we can tap into this and learn to think of this in creative and poetic and constructive ways, then, then, then you and I can become empowered to, to recreate in a very imaginative, very dramatic, very private, very idiosyncratic way, the story of our lives, right? And this was a really, it's a really beautiful thing because it's, 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 it's democratizing the potentiality for creativity. It's, it's democratizing the potentiality for every person to become a poet. Right, and this is very important for Rorty for two reasons. One, it's it's important because because Rorty found Nietzsche too aristocratic. Rorty found Nietzsche too elitist. Right, the for for Nietzsche the 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 pathos of distinction, the difference, this real difference for Nietzsche between these very powerful, creative, intellectual poets, these aristocrats. Right, and then everybody else, the slave morality, this pathos of distinction, that was a real thing for Nietzsche. It's, it's, it's an important, if controversial, part of his thinking, right? And, and Rorty thinks that, that that elitism is too cavalier, right? And that, and that it's not necessary. And, and so, 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 so Rorty wants everybody to be able to conceive of him or herself as possessing this, this sort of this potentiality to become the strong poet, to become creative in, in the envisioning of his or her own private life, right? And, and, and you do that by seeing your own collective unconscious as that, you know, as a, as a sort of reservoir from which to draw from, right? And, and in doing so, we, we kind of move beyond, Rorty would say, we move beyond the elitism of Nietzsche, the aristocracy of Nietzsche. Right, and, and, and this is a really, this, this is a beautiful moment. And, and this is how, and so if you wanted to talk about this in the context of the final, this is how, this is how Rorty democratizes Nietzsche. This is how Rorty tries to make Nietzsche amenable to democratic politics, right? And, and so on the top of 37, Rorty writes, seen from this angle, this re-describing, re-imagining how we use a collective unconscious as a reservoir for infinite creativity, this is what he's talking about, seen from this angle, the intellectual is just a special case. Just somebody who does with marks and noises what other people do with their spouses and children. This is beautiful. Their fellow workers, 
the tools of their trade, the cash accounts of their business, the possessions they accumulate in their homes, the music they listen to, the sports on their way to work. And, and here is one of the most beautiful passages of the whole book. And there's really something evocative and powerful about this, both uh, in, in the poetic way it's written and as a theoretical device. Anything, Rorty cites, right? And, and, and anything that is in your collective unconsciousness, right? That's there for you to retrieve or for you to think about or for you to meditate or, or, or it's there and you pass something and you think, God, what a beautiful light. Oh, look at the touch of that skin, right? Everything becomes a possibility from which a poetic description, a poetic meaning is possible. And, and, and which can be sort of expressed and, 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 and sort of pressed into the service of your life. And Rorty writes, anything from the sound of a word, through the color of a leaf, or to the feel of a piece of skin, can, can Freud showed us, serve to dramatize and crystallize a human being's sense of self-identity. Anybody can do this. Anybody can be a strong poet. Once you shift your gaze, once you open up yourself to thinking about language and thinking about your own consciousness and your own meaning and purpose and value from a different point of view. For any such thing can play the role in an individual life, which philosophers have thought could be played only by things which were universal or common to us all. Any seemingly random constellation of such things and, and, and in every one of your minds right now, in my mind, in every one of your minds are these almost seemingly random constellations of wild fucking ideas and associations and, and exciting things to think about. Everybody has in his or her own mind right now these extraordinary webbings and these networks of random constellations of things with meaning, potentiality for meaning, right? And this is what he's talking about. For any such thing, any seemingly random constellation of such things can set the tone for a life, right? That is so beautiful, right? Now, now look, if you want to go and read Proust, if you want to go and read Heidegger, if you want to go and read Derrida or Dostoevsky or Thomas Mann, right? Um, if, if you want to go read Wittgenstein and Nabokov, that's fabulous. But you don't have to read those things to be a strong poet. You don't have to read those things to, 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 to discover within your own mind and, and through your own experiences in the constellation of idiosyncratic relationships and possibilities, the resources from which you can draw on to, to give your life this extraordinary value, this extraordinary meaning, this extraordinary beauty, this extraordinary purpose. It's available for you right now. It's not out there. It's here. It's in all the things that have already happened to you, the sensations, the feelings, the joys, the lost loves, the traumas, the hopes, all that fucking stuff. For any such thing can play the role in an individual life. Any such constellation can set of such things can set the tone of a life. Another way of making this point, right? And, and, and this is the point I wanted to talk about. This is the, where we didn't get to talk about on Tuesday. And, 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 and Rorty has this, this fabulous, I, this kind of description about how art changes, how societies change how cultures change, how music changes, how literature changes, how poetry changes, how cultures changes, right? And, 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 and the way Rorty describes that, and, and I'll give you the language and then we'll talk about it. For Rorty, what, what, what Nietzsche called genealogy, what Nietzsche called genealogy, the historical process by which one set of ideas becomes dominant over another as an agonistic and conflictual process. What Nietzsche calls genealogy, Rorty will call the, the, way, the way private fantasy, 
meets a public need. History changes, changes in music take place, changes in art, in painting, in literature, and, and ultimately at the higher levels, changes in culture. Changes in all of these things take place through this process of what Rorty calls the moments where private obsession, private fantasy meets or finds a public need where private fantasy meets a public need. So let's talk about it, and then we'll talk about it. Another way of making this point is to say that the social process of literalizing a metaphor is duplicated in the fantasy life of an individual. We call something a private fantasy. We call something a private obsession. We call something a private fantasy rather than poetry or philosophy when it revolves around metaphors which do not catch on with other people. That is, around ways of speaking or acting which the rest of us cannot find, right? So the difference between, the difference between a public fantasy and philosophy or a public fantasy and a certain type of music or a private, a private fantasy, excuse me, and a certain type of painting is precisely that, that First, innovation starts with private fantasy, right? At some, at some point, Picasso, in his, in his, in his mind, had this, had this private fantasy, right? This, this, this private desire, this private fantasy to, to stop painting in the realist fashion, get tired of painting things that looked like the things they were supposed to look like, got tired of painting in the realist tradition. And his private fantasy was, what the fuck's going to happen if we cube this? What if, what if we ex destroy all the rules of realist painting? Perspective, linear lines, depth, shading. What if we explode all the rules of realist painting? What if we cube things? What if we make them two-dimensional? What, what if we rearrange body parts? What if we put the ear where the nose is supposed to be, right? And for Picasso, that, at that moment when Picasso's doing this, that's a private fantasy. It exists in his head. It's his obsession, it's his desire, it's his fantasy to rethink, to re-describe what fucking painting is and how it expresses things. And at some point, for some reason, Picasso's private fantasy catches on it catches on it meets a kind of public need right people other people come to the studio and they say oh fuck is that oh i've never seen that before holy smokes that's fucking amazing oh that's what painting can be a private fantasy meets a public need that is the evolution of art of music, of painting, of literature, of poetry, even of culture. New, new metaphors, new fantasies as metaphors, as descriptions. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna describe painting in this cubist and this post-cubist way as my private fantasy to re-describe art. I'm tired of old art. And I'm gonna do it. I have, this, I have the emotional strength and the, and the intellectual energy to do it. And then I'm gonna find the courage to show it to somebody. And guess what? Maybe they think it sucks. And that's right. Of course. Maybe, maybe the public doesn't pick it up. Right? Maybe the public, it maybe it doesn't fit a public need or a collective desire at that time or find a public expression. That's that's possible. But then your private fantasy just remains your what? Your private fantasy. And it's still just as fabulous. You don't have to justify it. But it might. Right? Picasso, Picasso all fundamentally re-describes in the, in, the, in the metaphor of what the hell painting is. Because his private fantasy, his private vision, his private obsession, his private neurosis doesn't And by the way, getting back to Freud, who, who the hell knows what shit was going on in Picasso's mind? 
about things that he painted Dora Maar, wasn't it? Right? And if you look at Dora Maar, if you look at the Cubist and the post-Cubist renderings of people, and you think, what the fuck was in Picasso's mind? Well, doesn't matter, right? But it was there, right? It was there in this kind of Freudian collective unconscious, and Picasso fucking tapped into it, not because he's doing something true or getting in contact with him, just tapped into it and, it, and it provided him a different way of seeing things, of describing things in painting, in visual form. And he trusted himself, and, right? And other people looked at that and they said, or other people heard Charlie Parker playing jazz and went, Same thing with rap that we talked about. In the 70s, the poetry, literally the poetry, the written word, what the, the invented words, what the stylized meaning of the words that became the poetry of hip hop or the poetry of rap. And, and, and the way that that poetry, that written word, some words totally invented, some words slang, some words stylized, some words with double entendres, the whole poetry of rap as a private fantasy coming from these people's experience, from people's experiences with poverty, with racism, right? With a kind of a, a, a culture. And the way it produced these extraordinarily powerful images and these words. But it was private. And the way the music got connected to that was private. And even for a long time, it remained private. As it, as it tried, as, as private fantasy tried to find a public need. And then it happened. And then it happened. People in the community, in the public, heard it, saw it, experienced it. And they said, and, they, and, and those people said to themselves, what a fucking interesting way to tell a story about racism or about hope or about police brutality or about systematic inequality, about injustice. What a fascinating fucking way to tell a story. Private fantasy meets a public need. And now what was originally a private fantasy of words, of, of literally the invention of new words, the invention of new meanings, the stylization of words that already exist, the poetry, the vocabulary that was created in all of that, the way that that was associated then with music. Now it's eponymous. It's everywhere. It's eponymous. It's ubiquitous. Private fantasy meeting public need as, as the process of cultural transformation of artistic transformation. Another way of making this point is to say that the social process of literalizing a metaphor is duplicated in the fantasy life of the individual. We call something fantasy rather than poetry, right? What's the difference between a, a private metaphor, a private obsession, and poetry? Well, the difference is, is that it's a private metaphor as long as it only is yours. It becomes poetry when other people what? Understand it, see it, accept it, find a need for it. Say to themselves, what a fascinating way to describe the sunset. What a fascinating way to describe urban life. What a fascinating way to describe these experiences. We call something fantasy rather than poetry or philosophy when it revolves around metaphors which do not catch on with other people. That is, around ways of speaking or acting which the rest of us cannot find a use for. Right, so it remains private. Conversely, and here's the beautiful line, then we move on. Conversely, when some private obsession, Picasso's cubism, hip hop, Charlie Parker's jazz riffs, David Bowie, right? Conversely, when some private obsession produces a metaphor, some, some word as a tool of description to describe something, 
Conversely, when some private obsession produces a metaphor, which we can, which the public can find a use for, we speak of genius rather than eccentricity. The difference between genius and fantasy, the difference between genius and fantasy is not the difference between impresses, influences, which lock onto something true, universal, some antecedent reality out there in the world, and those which do not. Rather, it is the difference between idiosyncrasies, private metaphors, which just happen to catch on with other people. Happen because of the contingencies of some historical situation, some particular need which a given community happens to have at a given time. Private fantasy meets public need. That's the movement of history. That's the change and transformation in art. All right, to sum up chapter two, poetic, artistic, philosophical, scientific, or political progress results from the accidental coincidence of private obsession with a public need. It's beautiful. That's Rorty's way of talking about genealogy. Strong poetry, common sense morality, revolutionary morality, normal science, revolutionary science, and the sort of fantasy which is intelligible to only one person are all, from a Freudian point of view, different ways of dealing with the influences that affect us all. All right. So let's now turn to chapter three. Now, chapter three, titled The Contingency of the Liberal Society, continues and complete Rorty's project, right? Rorty's, Rorty's project is to try to convince us, to describe a vision of language, to describe a vision of self, and to describe a vision of the liberal democracy in a fully postmodern way. All right? What happens if we think about language in a postmodern, what he calls contingency, in a postmodern way? What happens if we think about the self in a postmodern way, a strong poet? What happens now if we think about liberal democracy in a postmodern way? Can we, can, we, can, can we apply the ideas that we've been developing in chapter one and chapter two and apply those ideas to our current sort of historical moment? Can we apply those ideas to our current historical and political moment? We are the, we are the creatures who accidentally have found ourselves born into this place called America at the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century, right? This is, this is the, 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 the historical community that we can find ourselves contingently born into. Random, it's an accident. This is, this, is the, this is the community we are born into. And this community, like all communities, are, are historical contingencies. They're, they're particular constructions and effects of time and space, in particular, particular moments in historical time and space. And so Rorty wants to, wants to articulate a kind of vision of a postmodern liberal democracy. That's the goal of chapter three. And, and, and chapter three is titled, The Contingency of a Liberal Community. All right, and so he starts, all right? He starts out right on page 44. Right, and, and it's, it's a fascinating claim, actually. In this chapter, he says, I shall claim that the institutions and culture of liberal society, in this chapter, I shall claim that the institutions and culture of liberal democracy, of liberal society, would be served, would be better served by a vocabulary of moral and political reflection, 
which moves beyond metaphysics. Which moves beyond metaphysics. In this chapter, I'm going to try to argue that the institutions and culture of liberal democracy is better served by a postmodern vocabulary. Okay? And, and that's the point. And, 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 and it's very interesting because he's, he's saying two things. One, this is the community we accidentally and contingently find ourselves in, right? This, this kind of community of liberal democracy as it exists at the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st century with all its various components. This is where we find ourselves in this, this historical community called liberal democracy. It's got, this, it's got these commitments to these ideas of human freedom, um, human dignity, reduce harm, redu you know, work to something like a collective justice, reduce economic inequality, right? This is, this is our historical community. Liberal democracy is our historical community. And these are kind of the values it has. Sometimes it achieves them, sometimes it falls woefully short of them. But this is our community. Our community is a community of liberal democracy. And liberal democracy has these values. Human freedom is important. Respect for other people is important. Treating people with dignity is important. Reducing inequalities of opportunity um, and, and, and outcomes is important, right? All these things, these are, these, are, these, are, these are our values. And Rorty's gonna say, these values are better served by a vocabulary of postmodernism. Liberal democracy is, would be better served by thinking about the institutions and the cultures and the dominant values of liberal democracy from a postmodern point of view, right? And by the way, that's a pretty radical claim, right? That's a pretty radical claim. And in fact, he's, he's arguing exactly the opposite of what traditional enlightenment liberal democracy says, right? Traditional enlightenment liberal democracy says, as Mill said, in a way, as Mill said in a way, we have the values of human freedom. We have the values of respect and the dignity for other people. We have the values of individuality. We have the values of equality, right? We have the values that we do because we believe they're grounded metaphysically, because we believe that these values in some way reflect or correspond to some type of objective truth about human life, right? And Rorty, Rorty is making an extraordinarily bold claim in chapter three. The primary values of liberal democracy, freedom and equality and respect for others, the reduction of inequality, the creation of a kind of justice as fairness, social and political space, those values will be better served. We can, we can pursue and achieve those values better, more, more deeply, with a postmodern perspective. And so he says, in this chapter, I shall claim that the institutions and culture of liberal society would be better served by a vocabulary of moral and political reflection that is postmodern. And he says two lines later, he says, I will try to show that the vocabulary of enlightenment rationalism, although, he says, although it was essential to the beginnings of liberal democracy, has become an impediment to the preservation and progress of democratic societies. Right, and there's something really fascinating going on there. Rorty says, look, I understand, he says, on this page and the next couple of pages, I understand that in the 1600s, the 1700s, the 1800s, enlightenment paradigm, 
with its notion of reason, with its notion of rational progress, with its notion of freedom. I understand that when the Enlightenment first emerged, it understood rational progress from a metaphysical point of view. It understood human freedom from a kind of metaphysical point of view. Mill, Mill interpreted the self as something objectively true. Rory says, I understand that all of that was true. And I can even say, Rorty says, I can even see why, why that's important. I, he says, I understand why in the 1700s, as Enlightenment rationalism is emerging, as new, new ideas of human emer uh, freedom are emerging, as new ideas of human equality are emerging. I understand, Rorty says, why, why the people who were participating in the construction of those new ideas would like to attach them to some kind of metaphysical foundation. Like Locke did like we even do now when we, when we sort of valorize liberal democracies as superior forms of political organizations, right? Rorty says, I understand why there was a kind of desire to link these new ideas, freedom, equality, property in the body, liberal democracies, to some type of metaphysical foundation, to some kind of metaphysical truth. But Rorty says, and this is, this is what's kind of deeply fascinating about this chapter, Rorty says, that has now become an impediment. Metaphysics and the need to connect our notion of freedom, our notion of progress, our notion of equality, our notion of respect to other people, our need to insist that those ideas are metaphysically valid. That need is getting in the way of the progress of liberal society itself. That metaphysics is now an impediment to the deepening and the fulfillment of the core values of liberal democracy. Let me repeat, because it's, it's a bold argument, it's a radical argument. Metaphysics itself, the belief in some objective truth about human freedom as a constituent component of human nature, Of, of, the record, of the need that equality be grounded in some objective truth of the human condition. The idea that reason in this Millsian sense is this rational and progressive thing moving ever upwards and, and linear to higher and higher and elevated enlightened notions of political society. The need to link those ideas to truth is exactly what's standing in the way of liberal society, in a weird way, perfecting its own values. I shall try to show that the vocabulary of enlightenment rationalism, Mill, Mill's entire concept of enlightenment rationalism, although it was essential to the beginnings of liberal democracy, has become an impediment to the preservation and progress of democratic societies. So metaphysics itself, the belief in and commitment to some idea of objective truth is precisely what is now standing in the way of the deeper realization of liberal values, of human freedom, of treating people with respect, of treating people with dignity. And in a very interesting way, this is, this is, this is Rorty's kind of way of vibing Nietzsche's question that we found in the preface of the, of the origins uh, of the genealogy of morals. In the preface of the genealogy of morals, Nietzsche had raised this question. He had raised two questions, right? What is, what is, what is the origin of our highest values? And what is the value of our highest values? What are the origins of our highest values? And what is the value of our highest values? And he said, in, this, in his own kind of way, he said, what if it's the case that it is precisely the value of our highest values that is killing us? What if it's the case, he wrote, Nietzsche wrote in the preface, that it is precisely 
the value of our highest values, that was the greatest danger. And then, of course, he said, referencing to Platonic and New Testament Christian morality, he said, what if morality itself was the greatest danger to human beings? That was his point. What is the origin of our highest values? What is the value of our highest values? Do they, do they allow us to move forward or, or, or do they limit us? And what if it's the case, Nietzsche said, that it is in fact our values that are keeping us from moving forward? What if it's the fact that it, the value of our highest values is not valuable anymore? What if in fact it's morality itself, Nietzsche argued, that keeps us from being free, that keeps us from being strong, that keeps us from being creative? What if morality itself was the greatest danger to human beings, Nietzsche said. And Rorty's got a version of this here, right? He's got his own version of that here. It's not as, it's not as elitist, it's not as aristocratic, it's not as aggressive as Nietzsche to be sure. But, Nietzsche, but Rorty's raising the same issue. He says, look, I understand. I understand when, when Hobbes was, was writing, when Mill was writing, when Locke was writing. I understood that significant elements of the Enlightenment notion of freedom, of equality, of human rights, of respect for other people, of the reasons for types of, of, of liberal democracies with limited governments, Right? I understood why all of those ideas would have been interpreted from the point of view of a metaphysics, would have been attached to something like an objective truth. But it, one, it's no longer necessary to do that. And two, more importantly, it is precisely metaphysics that is standing in the way of liberal society realizing and developing and perfecting its own deepest values. I shall try to show you that the vocabulary of enlightenment metaphysics, what he calls enlightenment rationalism, but you can, you can just write enlightenment metaphysics, although it was essential to the beginnings of liberal democracy, has become an impediment to the preservation and progress of democratic societies. So on the bottom of 44, in what follows, he says, I shall be trying to reformulate. Let me redescribe. Let me reformulate. I shall be trying to reformulate the hopes of liberal society in a non-metaphysical way. Let me try to redescribe the values and the hopes, the deepest values, the deepest hopes of a liberal society from a non-metaphysical perspective. Can we conceive, pursue, and achieve the deepest values of liberalism, freedom, respect for others, treating people as equals, limited government? Can we conceive, pursue, and achieve the deepest values of liberal society in a postmodern way? And in fact, he's going to say yes. In fact, in fact, as we just said a few minutes ago, he, his view is that it is precisely metaphysics. It is the, it is the kind of inertia, the, the latent presence of this metaphysics, this, this need to ground everything in the truth. It's precisely that, that nostalgia, that metaphysical nostalgia that actually gets in the way of us pursuing, achieving, and deepening the core liberal values. If we want to perfect liberalism, we've got to kick away metaphysics. We used, we used metaphysics as a ladder to get to these values, but now we've got these values. And now, and now relying on the ladder is an impediment. We don't need the ladder, we can kick the ladder. We can conceive, pursue, and achieve liberal democratic values without metaphysics. In fact, in fact, in fact, the abandoning of the metaphysical vocabulary, Rorty will say, is the last step in the perfection of a postmodern liberalism. In what follows, I shall be trying to reformulate 
the hopes and values of liberal society in a non-metaphysical way. But one, but one which furthers their realization better than older descriptions of them. It's a bold argument. Okay, top of 45, first paragraph. For in its ideal form, right, if, if we were to perfect the secular values of freedom, of individuality, of respect for others, of this kind of idea, don't do harm to other people, if we were to perfect that in a non-metaphysical way, of course, right? He says, for in its ideal form, the culture of liberalism would be one which was enlightened, secular, through and through. It would be one in which no trace of divinity remained, either in the form of a divinized world, God created the universe, or in the view of an objectively true self, a divinized self. Such a postmodern liberal culture, such a culture would have no room for the notion that there are non-human forces. Plato's pure ideas, God. There are no non-human forces to which human beings should be responsible. It would drop. Again, it would stop talking the, the vocabulary of metaphysics. It would drop. It would drop or drastically reinterpret not only the idea of holiness, but of those of devotion to the truth and of fulfillment of the deepest needs of the spirit. The process of de-divinization, which I described in the previous two chapters, would ideally culminate in our no longer being able to see any use for the notion that finite, mortal, contingently existing human beings might derive meaning of their lives from anything else but their own lives. Okay. De-objectify. De-divinize liberal culture. Kick the ladder of metaphysics away. Bottom of 45. My emphasis on Freud's claim that we should think of ourselves as just one more experiment, one more contingent poetry of self-creation, not as the culmination of some metaphysical language or nature's design, echoes Berlin's use of J.S. Mill's face, right? So here he is. So, so Rorty wants to make Mill postmodern. Echoes Berlin's use of J.S. Mill's phrase, experiments in living, right? Mill had celebrated experiments in living. Mill had experiment. Remember in chapter three, Mill said, right, you've got to go out in order to get the other people's voices outside of your head, right? You've got to go out and you've got to expose yourself to as many modes of thought and cultures and ways of life and experiments and living as humanly possible. And for Mill, you had to do that because that gave you the highest likelihood or the best chance of finding those things which, which identified with your true self. So Mill was obsessed in this kind of liberal experiments of living. Except Rorty wants to make those experiments of living postmodern. He wants to operationalize those experiments of living in a postmodern way. Right. And, and by and by the way, that's that's what Rorty thinks liberal democracies are. That's what Rorty thinks liberal democracies are. So, again, my emphasis on. My emphasis on Freud's claim that we should think of ourselves as poetic self creations echoes Berlin's use of Mill's phrase, experiments in living. So how do we make, how do we make Mill postmodern? How do we make Mill's liberal democracy, this highly pluralistic, highly dynamic, 
sometimes competitive, sometimes combative kind of intellectual space. How do we, how do we create what Mill called the enlightened, elevated democratic space with these great diversity of ideas and opinions and views, right? How do we make that postmodern? Top of 46. And, and Rorty, he's quoting Berlin and he's, he's quoting uh, Arzea Berlin's famous lectures on, on freedom. And, and Rorty writes, Berlin ended his essay by quoting Joseph Schumpeter. And this is something that Rorty is going to accept. This is something that Rorty wants us to, to kind of see and identify. And, and Schumpeter wrote, Berlin is quoting him, and to realize, to realize the relative validity of one's convictions, right? And what does that mean? To realize that our deepest values are wholly contingent. That's what that means, right? To realize that case our deepest values of liberal democracy human freedom respect for other people dignity re representing a kind of core equality right right to recognize that our deepest values those values the values of the liberal democracy to realize the contingency of those values are we emotionally strong enough and intellectually strong enough to see our deepest values as contingent, as accidents of time and place, right? This is what he's talking about. To realize the relative validity of one's convictions. What are our convictions? Our convictions are freedom and respect for others, working towards greater equality, right? Those are our values. Those are our convictions to realize the relative validity of one's convictions, that these are, these are contingent, they're human inventions, they're accidents of time and space. That's what he means when he says to realize the relative validity of one's convictions. And yet, here's the key, and yet to still stand for them unflinchingly, to support them, to be committed to them and try to advance them. Schumpeter writes, is what distinguishes civilized men from barbarians. That's an unuseful sort of juxtaposition. But the point is, what, what constitutes a kind of nobility for Rorty, what constitutes nobility for Rorty is precisely the fact that you and I can recognize that our deepest values are contingent. They're not objectively real. They're not metaphysically grounded. They are human inventions. But they are human inventions, which for one reason or another, appear to us at this moment in time and space to be good. From, from our perspective, from our kind of cultural cave. We can say, the kind of the, the values, the core values of liberal democracy, enhancing human freedom, leaving people alone to cultivate their private lives, treating people equally, working to, to distribute scarce resources more justly, working to reduce oppression based on things like racism or other things. We can say those, those values are good despite the fact that they're human inventions. And in fact, the opposite is precisely because they're human inventions and that we can commit to them and support them and work to their perfection. That's what makes someone noble for Rorty. To recognize the contingency of your own values but still believe in them, still support them, still protect them, still fight for them. That's the key. Page 48. 
Last paragraph, page 48. To accept the claim that there is no standpoint outside of the particular historically conditioned and temporary vocabulary we are presently using, right? Can't get outside language. And there's no meta language to tell us which language to speak. That's what he's referring to. He's referring back to the arguments from chapter one. That's what the contingency of language means. To accept the claim that there is no standpoint outside the particular historically conditioned and temporary vocabulary we are presently using from which to judge this vocabulary is to give up on the idea that there can be reasons for using languages as well as reasons within languages. Once we realize, bottom of page 48, once we realize that progress for the community as for the individual is a matter of using new words as well as of arguing from premises phrased in old words, we realize that a critical vocabulary which used to revolve around rational and argument and criteria is no longer useful. So we need, we need to poeticize the language. Fifty one. Bottom of page fifty one. It is central, he writes. It is central to the idea of a liberal society that. And again, he, he's just riffing Mill here, right? He he is he is just vibing Mill. He's taking Mill into a postmodern reality. It is central to the idea of a liberal society that in respect to words as opposed to deeds, right? This is the harm principle. What did Mill say about freedom, right? The person, the individual ought to be as radically free to think, act, and do whatever one wants as long as it doesn't do what? Harm somebody, right? It is central to the idea of a liberal society that in respect to words as opposed to deeds, persuasion as opposed to force, anything goes, right? And, and this is Rorty's postmodern harm principle, right? I should be as free, a postmodern ideal form of a secular liberal society is literally one in which people are genuinely free to think anything they want in their private life in the in the construction and the creation of their own meanings and purposes and values so long as it doesn't harm anybody right and 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 and, and if you want to think about it in a playful way right? Rorty is trying to perfect what Mill tried to do, but Mill couldn't do because of the metaphysics. At the, and and, and, and this, was the, this was the drama we found in chapter four, right? Right? Remember we were reading Mill and we got to chapter four, and we ran into all that difficulty in chapter four. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, Mill said, just so nobody thinks that this doctrine is, a, this, this book is a, is a doctrine of selfish indifference, we, we have a duty to help other people to elevate their thinking. Remember that? Remember Mill said, you and I at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, Mill has some metaphysical idea in the back of his head about what the elevated person looks like, what the kind of the superior form or mode of life looks like, right? And there was that, there was chapter four. He says, look, this is, this is not a doctrine of selfish indifference. In fact, quite the opposite. He said, you and I have a duty 
to inform and help other people who have depraved thoughts, who have low thoughts, who have inferior thoughts. We have a duty to help those people not think that. That's what he said. And therefore, we have a duty to, at the end of the day for Mill to tell them what to think or to, or to ignore them or to shame them for thinking what they're thinking. Because at the end of the day, Mill had this distinction, this hierarchy of life. Better a dissatisfied Socrates than a satisfied fool. And, 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 and chapter four was so difficult precisely because Mill could not let go of this latent classical metaphysics, this aristocratic liberalism. It was precisely the aristocratic part, his commitment to classical rational rationalism and, 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 and ultimately superior forms of life. It was precisely that commitment to the metaphysics that, that kept him from going to the logical conclusion of his own thoughts. And that's what Rorty's doing here. We can perfect liberalism, the very values of private freedom, of personal meaning, of getting the voice in your head by abandoning the metaphysics. At the end of the day, it's precisely the metaphysics that gets in the way, as it did for, as it did for Mill. Mill couldn't abandon the aristocratic element of his thinking. And because he couldn't abandon the aristocratic slash metaphysical slash teleological element of his thinking, it ultimately limited his account of liberal freedom and liberal democracy. We found ourselves in chapter four, precisely what we were warned against in chapter two. Be very careful about how you tell people how to live their lives. As Mill said in chapter two, people need protection from moral influence. People need to be protected from everybody else telling them how to eff and live their life. As he said, Mill said, the, the real tyranny of liberal democracy isn't, isn't the, the tyranny of the majority. It's not a political tyranny. It's the tyranny of social opinion. Social opinion about what? All these people telling you how to live and how to think and how to make love and who to marry and what books to read. That's the tyranny. And by the way, it's a real tyranny because it reaches all the way down to your soul. And while Mill wants to give a profound and eloquent defense against that, he has to reauthorize it in chapter four, because at the end of the day, he's committed to some, some, some objectively true self, and not just some objectively true self, but some vision of a kind of superior form of human life. As he says in chapter four, there can be people who have such a depravity of thought there can be people who demonstrate such a lowness of thought, such a depravity of thought, that, that we, Mill says, I actually have a moral obligation to tell them, hey, get your shit together. And this is exactly what Rorty's talking about. This, this is why the attempt to connect freedom and private fulfillment and personal freedom and respecting others, this is why at the end of the day, those values, those core values of liberal democracy are badly served by metaphysics. At the end of the day, metaphysics cripples the project. It has to. Rorty wants to eliminate chapter four of Mills on Liberty. How do you eliminate chapter four of Mills on Liberty? You get rid of the metaphysics. You dump the vocabulary of truth. It's precisely your commitment to truth that is standing in the way of your private freedom, of your meaning, of your personal fulfillment of living a life that is genuinely self-created.
It's exactly your commitment to truth that cripples you from doing that. Cripples not just you, but the society from manifesting, realizing its deepest values. What if it turns out that our highest values were the problem? In a Nietzschean language. What are the values of our highest values? <laughs> and what if it turns out that our highest values are precisely the problem? It is central to the idea of a liberal society, Rody writes, that in respect to words as opposed to deeds, persuasion as opposed to force, you can't, you can't force anyone to think something, stop doing it. Persuasion as opposed to force, anything goes. And again, let, let's vibe Mill. Here we go. This open mindedness, Rorty says, this open mindedness should not be fostered because, as scripture teaches, truth is great and will prevail. Or, as Milton suggests, truth will always win in a free and open encounter. That's not why we foster this open-mindedness. It should be fostered for its own sake in a fully postmodern, in a fully de-divinized, in a fully de-secular liberal society. You would foster open-mindedness for its own sake. And by the way, this is this is a this is a little jab at Rorty again. Back to not back to Mill. Mill had said in chapter two. We have debate, we have to tolerate, Mill said. The best reason, Mill said, for, for tolerating opposing views, even about views that we don't like or offend us, is because by tolerating all these views and weighing one another against another, and, and we, we're, we're gonna slowly get to what? The truth. Weighing all these opposing views, balancing these opposing views, listening to these opposing views was important, Mill said, because that helps us get to the what? The truth in this kind of Socratic dialectic he had. And now Rorty says, that's not why you don't foster open-mindedness or debate or dialectic because you think you're getting to some truth. You do it for its own sake. A liberal society, he writes, is one which is content to call true whatever the upshot of such encounters turns out to be. That is why a liberal society is badly served by the attempt to supply it with philosophical foundations. Page 53. One, two, three, four, six lines down. Page 53. We need a redescription of liberalism as the hope that culture as a whole can be poeticized rather than as the enlightenment hope that it can be rationalized. That's the difference between Mill and Rorty. That is, we need to substitute the hope that chances for fulfillment of idiosyncratic fantasies, your private life, that private vocabulary and those metaphors you're using to make your life beautiful, meaning and erotic and deep and idiosyncratic. That is, we need to substitute the hope that chances for fulfillment of idiosyncratic fantasies will be equalized as a hope that everyone will be able to do this. In my view, an ideally liberal society would be one whose cultural hero is the strong poet. And now with Freud, everybody's capable of being what? Strong poet. Rather than the priest, the sage, the truth-seeking, logical, objective scientist. Middle of the page. To think such a justification sufficient would be to draw the consequences from Wittgenstein's insistence that vocabularies all vocabularies, even those which contain words which we take the most seriously, freedom, justice, equality, the ones most essential to our self-descriptions of our society, our human creations, tools for the creation of other such human artifacts. A poeticized culture, bottom of the page, 
A poeticized culture would be one which would not insist that we find the real wall behind the painted ones, the real touchstones of truth as opposed to the ones that are merely cultural artifacts. Sixty-one, last thing. Bottom of sixty, last point. But this is to say that an ideal postmodern liberal society is one which has no purpose except freedom, no goal except a willingness to see how such encounters go and to abide by the outcome. It has no purpose except to make life easier for poets and revolutionaries. It is a society whose hero is the strong poet and the revolutionary because it recognizes that it is what it is, has the morality it has, and speaks the language that it does. 63, the last point, as J.S. Mill, bottom of 63, J.S. Mill's suggestion that governments devote themselves to optimizing the balance between leaving people's private lives alone and preventing suffering seems to me pretty much the last word. It has been an extraordinary joy getting to know all of you, having you in class, getting to know many of you deep, more deeply. I cannot express how proud I am of all of you for the strength and the intellectual creativity you have shown in this class and what we've done. It has been without a doubt one of the best classes I've ever had in 30 years of university teaching. And it has been one of the best classes I've ever had in 30 years of university teaching, despite the extraordinary existential challenges we have all faced. You guys have met your moment in history and you've transcended it and you've thrived and you're, you're absolutely heroic, strong poets in Nietzsche's sense. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You, professor. Thank you so Thanks, much, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, Dr. Dungy. Thank you, Thank you very much, Nick. Yeah. Safe travels. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Dungy. Have and, a good and, summer. Yep, and stay in touch. I'll see some of you next fall. The rest of you, you owe me an email. Let me know how you're doing. Okay. All right, safe travels. Bye. Yep. Thank you. Luck, Goodbye, Nick. Bye, Brian. Bye, Brian. Be safe. Yep, you too, my friend. Okay.